Charles Windolph's gripping account of Custer's last stand takes us deep into the heart of one of America's most iconic battles. As one of the few survivors of the Battle of Little Bighorn, Windolph's story offers a rare first-hand glimpse of the chaos, bravery, and tragedy that unfolded on that fateful day. A German immigrant, he had enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1872, eventually earning the Medal of Honor for his courageous actions during the battle. His detailed account remains one of the most powerful testimonies to this significant chapter in American history. The sun was high on June the 25th, 1876, as we crossed the divide between the Rosebud and Little Bighorn rivers. Our regiment, 600 men strong, rode westward in orderly columns, each company separated by 50 or 60 feet. It was just after noon when the unexpected happened. Lieutenant Cook ordered Ben Teen to take his Company H, along with Companies D and K, to scout ahead and engage any hostile forces. Meanwhile, General Custer held back with four companies, while Major Reno led three other companies along with our Indian scouts. At the time, we knew we were approaching a large enemy force, though the exact numbers eluded us. While some of our scouts suspected thousands of warriors lay ahead, Custer and many of our officers assumed we faced a group of no more than 1,500 poorly armed Indians. Little did we know we were walking into an ambush, outnumbered by a staggering five to one. Custer had planned a surprise attack at dawn the next day, but his hand was forced when enemy scouts spotted us. Benteen led three troops ahead to survey the rugged terrain, but for hours, Lieutenant Gibson signaled back that no Indians were in sight. We began to feel as if our mission was in vain. But as we turned back, the relief of returning to Custer's trail quickly turned into dread. We heard gunfire in the distance. As we pressed on, we encountered signs that a battle had already begun. A burning teepee set alight by our Indian scouts told us we were drawing closer. The horses became anxious as if sensing the danger. Just then, we spotted Sergeant Knipe delivering orders for Captain McDougall to quicken his pace with the pack mules. Moments later, Trumpeter Martini arrived, wounded but determined, delivering a message from Custer himself. His horse was bleeding, but Martini, who had once been a drummer boy for Garibaldi in Italy's fight for independence, showed no fear. He was one of us, a soldier through and through, proving his mettle that day. The situation was dire. The gunfire ahead grew louder as we advanced. Benteen gave the order to ready our pistols, and we galloped ahead, bracing for battle. As we reached the crest of the bluffs, the sight that met our eyes was nothing short of horrifying. Below us, in the valley, chaos reigned. Figures on horseback raced wildly, gunshots echoing in all directions. Further down the river, we saw vast groups of mounted warriors. My heart pounded. Every man there knew the battle was upon us, and we had no choice but to face it head on. Riding fast, we soon caught sight of our own. Soldiers dismounted, holding their ground on a small knoll to the north. Without hesitation, we charged toward them, driven by the pounding of our hearts and the adrenaline coursing through our veins. But before we rejoined our comrades, let me take a moment to recount the fate of Major Reno's battalion. Although I wasn't present for all of it, the stories of survivors have been told so often that they're etched in my memory. Reno had been given command of three companies, along with Indian and white scouts. Custer, meanwhile, led his own detachment along a different route. Reno's force crossed the Little Bighorn River, unaware of the massive Indian village just two miles ahead. As they approached, the scene began to unfold. Soon, Reno's men were attacked by hundreds of mounted warriors. 
For 10 minutes, they held their ground, firing in skirmish formation. But as the Indians surrounded them, Reno gave the order to retreat, and that's when things began to fall apart. Men scattered in confusion, horses stampeded, and in the chaos, many soldiers were cut down, killed, or scalped. Some made it back across the river and up a steep hill on the other side, where they were met by reinforcements, including Benteen and his troops. But while Reno's men struggled for survival, Custer's situation was even more desperate. Riding further north, Custer's five companies encountered the full strength of the Indian forces, thousands of warriors. The fighting was fierce, but Custer's men were vastly outnumbered. Surrounded on all sides, they fought bravely, but one by one, they were cut down. By evening, the sounds of battle had faded. Reno and Benteen's forces, still dug in on their hilltop, knew their comrades were likely lost. The next morning, the Indians withdrew, having secured a decisive victory. Two days later, General Terry's column arrived, too late to change the outcome. The Battle of Little Bighorn was over, and the soldiers who survived, including men like Charles Windolph, would carry the memory of that fateful day for the rest of their lives. The bravery and resilience of those who fought, both those who survived and those who fell, offer a poignant reminder of the harsh realities of frontier warfare. Windolph's account paints a vivid picture of this unforgettable moment in American history. Stay tuned for more first-hand accounts of other battles, and thank you for joining us on this journey through time.